Reading with your kids. Hey, 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 so great to see you. Come on in. Hi, my name is Jed Lee, and this is the Reading with Your Kids podcast, coming to you from the beautiful neighborhood of Reedville in the southwest corner of Boston, Massachusetts. Have you connected with us online? We can be found at Facebook.com slash Reading With Your Kids. On Twitter, it's at Jedly Magic. On Instagram, it's Reading With Your Kids. Our guest is coming to us today from Wapakoneta in Ohio. Her name is Rinda Beach, and she is the author of Neil Armstrong's Wind Tunnel Dream. Before we blast off from Wapakoneta, we want to let you know that this episode of the Reading With Your Kids podcast is brought to you by Noah Noah Source by Elaine Kylie Kearns. Do you know someone who is a Noah Source? Is your child a Noah Source? Does your child ever have one of those days where they wake up and their answer to everything is no? Well, have I got a picture book for you. Noah Noah Source by Elaine Kylie Kearns. No one knows source woke up feeling very no. No to brushing his teeth, no to eating breakfast, and definitely no to playing with his little brother. Things only get worse when Noah goes for a walk and discovers that the relentlessly cheerful Toby Rex, Brian Brontosaurus, and Ava Ceratops are following him. Together, the group starts a bona fide dino parade that even Noah cannot resist. This light-hearted, whimsical story will have readers laughing along at Noah and his friends as well as their own bad moods. This hilarious book pairs two of little kids' favorite things, saying no and dinosaurs. Adults can relate to waking up on the wrong side of the bed and feeling very no all day too. Noah Noah Source is available on Amazon and on Elaine's website, ElaineKylieKearns.com. This episode of the podcast is also brought to you by our friends at Familius Publishing. That's right, Familius Publishing. Their website is Familius.com. We've had so many wonderful guests on the show from Familius. Our last guest, Pierre Lemille, and his Munchy Munchy Cookbook. That is a Familius publication. Dr. John DeGarmo was on celebrating the Little Book of Foster Care Wisdom. Brad Berger was on celebrating the Big Book of Family Games. We also celebrated the Opposite Book by Larissa Hunsick. We love Familius. They are a global trade publishing company that publishes books and other content to help families be happy. We believe that the family is a fundamental unit of society and that happy families are the foundation of a happy life. We recognize that every family looks different and we passionately believe in helping all families find greater joy. To that end, we publish books for children and adults that invite families to live the familiar nine habits of happy family life. Love together, play together, learn together, work together, talk together, heal together, read together, eat together, and laugh together. Check them out. Familius.com, F-A-M-I-L-I-U-S.com, Familius.com. And be sure to follow them at Familius Talk on Instagram to learn more about all of their titles and to stay up to date with all their latest releases. Be sure to check it out, our friends at Familius.com. And we also want to be sure to let you know that this episode of the Reading With Your Kids podcast is brought to you by the Queen Vernita Visitor Series by author Dr. Don Minge. This is a really, really fun and educational series of nine books that your families will love. You're all going to love following the Queen and her 12 subjects as they explore a new and exotic region each new year. The Queen's subjects teach her all about stalactites, sharks, seahorses, glaciers, volcanoes, and so much more. Now, you're also in the Queen Vernita Visitor Series. You're going to learn about folks who are different. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Do- Dr. Don Minge is a special education teacher. And so all of her books touch on disabilities or oh, folks with disabilities, such as Down syndrome, Rett syndrome, cerebral palsy, deafness, visual impairment, and autism. Her books help kids understand a little bit about what those neurodifferences are and also 
helps remind our kids that kids with these neuro differences, with these physical and, and neurological challenges, are kids and they can be great friends. Pam Schneider has provided bright, colorful, and whimsical illustrations that perfectly complement the text. The Queen Vernita Visitor Series will make a great addition to any classroom or child's bookshelf. Check it out today. It's the Queen Vernita Visitor Series by author Dr. Don Menge. Joining us right now from Wapakoneta in Ohio. She is the author of a great, great book called Neil Armstrong's Wind Tunnel Dream. A perfect a perfect subject uh, right now here in the summer of 2019 when we're celebrating the 50th anniversary of Mr. Armstrong stepping onto the moon. Please welcome to the show, Rinda Beach. Rinda, how are you? I am great. I'm great. It's been a busy couple weeks in Wapakoneta with the 50th anniversary, so things are finally starting to calm down a little. Yeah, let's. We're definitely going to spend a lot of time talking about Neil Armstrong's wind tunnel uh, dream. But let's talk a little bit about what's going, what's been going on. We've just uh, we just celebrated the 50th anniversary, uh, and I imagine you know what what sounds like a, a typically uh, quiet town must have been filled with news people and tourists and and other folks who are curious. Absolutely, um, especially the local news, not so much national news, but we did make the national news a couple times, and uh-huh. there were people posting all kinds of neat things, like at the beginning of the Moon Festival, um, they had balloons go up, and then the second night, I'd never, they called them luminaries, they had all the balloons in a row, and they were all lit up oh, at cool. night, and it was just gorgeous, That's just gorgeous. Great. Now we've we're we're in in the same generation. I was a little bit older than you when when Neil made that historic uh, leap down or one giant step for man or uh, however he said it. But I remember very well. I um, uh, when he landed, we had, my my cousin and I had just uh, gone to see a Godzilla movie at our local theater. <laughs> And my uh, my mom and my dad, it must have been my mom, my dad never picked me up anyway, <laughs> but my mom picked this up inward, and, and that was special. We usually had to walk home from the theater, but I think uh, my mom wanted me to be in the car and at least hear on the radio uh, the moment that the... Um, uh, the, 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 the limb, I think they, it was called the limb, um, landed on the moon. And then we were home in time, of course, hours later when, uh, man finally stepped down onto the moon. What do you remember doing when the, uh, Neil made history? Well, as a 10 year old, I would have been going into fifth grade. Mm -hmm. My biggest thing that I remember is that I got to stay up late. Ah. That was a huge, huge deal. And I remember watching it in black and white, Mm -hmm. even though in 1969 we all had color TVs. I mean, the kids now wouldn't understand how wonderful a Saturday after or Saturday morning could be. Because back in the day when Neil Armstrong landed on the moon, um, there were only cartoons on Saturday morning. Mm -hmm. That was the only, that was like kids' day. Mm -hmm. And when, uh, when we got them in color, it was just like, uh, it was the greatest thing ever. Well, we, we, we didn't have color TV at that time. In fact, I have very, my, my kids c- can't understand this at all. There was one family in our neighborhood. In fact, it was my aunt who had, um, the first color TV in our neighborhood. And she lived on the second floor of her three, three decker apartment building. But, uh, everybody chip, you know, came around and carried the TV downstairs. I think it was every Wednesday night so the kids in the neighborhood could sit on the sidewalk and watch Batman in color. Uh, those were the days. <laughs> those were big things. And living in Wapakoneta back in 1969, um, I live out in an addition called Oakwood Hills and, um, two blocks over from my house, um, lived Neil's parents. Mm -hmm. They had moved out of just on the edge, just outside of town. So it was a big deal to ride my bike past their house. Absolutely. Yeah. And and all the people that was post that were posted there, the newsmen. And I've read there's, there's a book that Neil actually 
um, allowed to be written about him. It's called, I think it's called First Man, or I, I have the book. But um, they talked about how um, for his parents, that they, I think Stephen and Viola, they brought in a color TV for them. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just it's just a simple house. Now his childhood house, um, and they moved a lot because Neil's dad um, was an accountant somehow for the state. Mm-hmm. So I think he was like in nine towns growing up or something. Um, but they lived on a street, I can't remember the name, in Wapak, and Neil's parents were still on that street. And someone was telling me that when Neil was grown up, probably in the 60s, um, and he would fly back to Dayton, he would fly his plane in back of this house. It was just field then. And it was his way of, no, of letting his parents know that he would be in Dayton pretty soon and then pretty soon back on to Wapak. So wow. here's the character, yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, as, as we're speaking and we're talking about, you know, people having color TVs and not having color TVs, it's amazing to think that, that man was able to accomplish this monumental feat when we – we're just at the infancy of our technological age. You know, right now I've, I've heard people say that the, the little rectangular things that kids walk around with in their pockets, these things <laughs> that they use to make videos and send messages all over the world in the blink of an eye, that there's actually more computing, computing power in those little cell phones than they had um, to, to get man back and forth to the moon safely. I was thinking about that because for the last two weeks, I've been blogging about Neil and his adventures Mm -hmm. and looking at my phone. And there were no um, there were no phones like that back in the day. You only had landlines Mm -hmm. and we even had party lines back back then (laughs) where the whole street could hear what you were saying. And and you didn't want to talk to a boy on the party line unless everybody was off of it. (laughs) So, yeah. The good those, old days. Those were the days. Well, let's talk about, let's jump into Neil Armstrong's Wind Tunnel Dream. Tell us all about this great book, please. Okay. Well, let's start with how I got the idea. Mm-hmm. Um, I volunteer out at the Armstrong um, Air and Space Museum, and I nev- I decided not to become a docent. I, I'm a writer, so I wanted to make sure I spent my time in my in my chair writing. So I didn't go ahead and docent, but as part of the training process, you can go in now and in one of the cases of the museum, they have um, stuff from Neil's scouting days. He was an Eagle Scout, by the way. Mm-hmm. And um, two of the small pieces there are from the original wind tunnel. And I thought, this is interesting. And he was he was 16 when he built it. That's not, it doesn't seem like an average thing to do. He was also a senior in 1946. Um, back in first grade, Neil read a hundred books and in 1936, when he would have been going into first grade, there was no kindergarten and there weren't lots of books at your level. So he came into second grade reading at a fourth, fifth grade level. His second grade teacher took a look at him and sent him on to third grade. And that's how he was able to graduate at 16. He didn't turn 17 until August of 1947. So he, he was a young senior. He decided to build this wind tunnel and not just any wind tunnel. He wanted it to be just like the Wright brothers who are from Dayton, Ohio. And that was a huge deal for him. And he did it as part of his um, physics class in as a high school senior. I think that year he also built a Tesla coil, which I'm not even sure what that is. It just sounds highly technical. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know from my, my limited knowledge of science and, and, and history, um, I believe Tesla had and he was a competitor with Edison, I think. And I think Tesla's idea was to distribute electricity um, uh, wirelessly. 
So mm-hmm. you wouldn't need wires. You wouldn't need to plug in. There would be electricity in the air, and that would power everything, um, which sounds really neat. But I also hear that that would interfere with radios and laptops and things like mm-hmm. that. So who knows who was right? But um, whatever, that's it. That's it. building a wind tunnel and a, a Tesla device in high school. That seems, and, and especially back then, uh, what, what a huge accomplishment. He he must have had the most incredible physics teacher because this guy would just say what it sounded like, whatever you wanted to build, that's what you got to do. Mm-hmm. And Neil just was into that. But um, he had his sights on aviation from the time he was two. The earliest that I could find in my research was that um, he went to the Cleveland Air Races at two and fell in love with, with planes. And he was building airplanes with paper, with with anything he could find around the house. And about the time he was 10, um, his cousin introduced him to balsa wood. And it must have been like the heaven opened up and, and the angels sang. <laughs> but um, it was quite a big deal. And he was always into building a better plane, mm-hmm. always. And, in fact, one of the stories I saw was that um, when he had too many planes hanging from the ceiling of his bedroom, he would take out the ones that he didn't didn't want to keep, and he would send them out the second-story window of his house. And you can you can drive by the house. If, if you're lucky, you'll come at a time when they're doing a tour. And um, you can see where he threw out the, the airplanes. But this part, I need to tell your audience, please don't do this at home unless you have your parents with you. Um, <laughs> Neil would actually set some of the planes on fire so that he could watch their smoky trail to the ground. Because then you would know how to build a better plane. Oh, f- uh, that's, that's <laughs> amazing. Talk about the scientific mind at work. Uh-huh. Yeah, but well, we definitely don't want to do those experiments at home, kids, parents. No, say, you no, know, no, no, no. We don't want to do that. <laughs> and I can't imagine that his mom would have allowed him to do that. Mm-hmm. So I have a feeling they did it when she wasn't around. But, I mean, he he just had a mind for flight. When he was in middle school, most kids, most boys would be reading comic books. Mm-hmm. Not Neil. Um, he worked at the drugstore up in town, uptown Ryden Braden, Braden, and um, he would look at the um, aviation magazines. He'd have a notebook, and he'd take notes about the wind tunnels and, and how they worked and any stats he could put down. And he kept these notebooks all through middle school and into high school. So he he had the scientific brain. Yeah. What a fascinating guy. And, and he also had that determination we also often talk about here, you know, that, that I am going to do this, I'm going to make this happen no matter what anybody says. Mm-hmm. I found a quote, and I've used it to autograph books. Um, he thinks, this was in his high school yearbook, he thinks he acts his done. And I said, that's how Neil dreams. I mean, he, he would think of what he wanted to do, He'd make a plan, and then he'd work the plan. And if it didn't go quite right at first, he would keep working it till it finally came out the way he wanted it to. You know, he he just is he's quite the character. Yeah, yeah. What a terrific role model for for kid. Well, for anybody, but especially for kids. And yeah. I'm imagining that this would be a fantastic book to sit down and read as a family. And in, in just, a, just a great way to start a conversation about, uh, about believing in yourself, about dreams, about dreaming, and, and encouraging our kids to dream. Uh, one of the things, we've talked about it here in the show in, in the past, that there, there are lots of studies that show the kids with dreams, kids who have goals, they do better in school, they're happier, they're healthier. And mm-hmm. I was really surprised after I, after I was reading the study – I decided I'd, I'd take a very non-scientific uh, kind of poll, and when I was doing my educational magic shows, I would ask kids, how many of you guys have a dream? How many of you guys think, when I grow up, I want to do this or that? Or, and even if it's changed, it doesn't matter. How many of you had those? And I was really expecting most kids to raise their hand, but I was 
really shocked and kind of disappointed to find that at best 50 to 60 percent of the kids would raise their hands at uh, at a presentation uh, that it was never more than that and it really surprised me yeah I mean and that's that's the thing you can learn so much from Neil mm-hmm. I mean when he was 10 years old um, he was mowing grass at um, in the upper Sandusky um, cemetery he wasn't afraid of ghosts <laughs> But yeah, and, and that was so he could buy balsa wood, mm-hmm. as far as I can tell. So he could buy model airplanes or whatever it is that he was going to buy. But he was already earning his own money to do his own thing. Um, one of the other things that amazes people is that he got his pilot's license at age 16 before he got his driver's license. Wow. Yeah. He, he paid, and if you think about 1936... Oh, no, I'm sorry, 1946 now, mm-hmm. 1946. We're just past the Great Depression. We're into World War II. And um, he's paying $9 an hour to take flight lessons over the summer before his senior year. Wow. And back based on what the minimum wage was when I started working many years after that, he was probably only making 25 30 cents an hour. I think so. Yeah. I think so. The cemetery job, I think I, I looked at my stats and it was like 10 cents. Wow. Ten, yeah. But he was willing to do it because mm-hmm. he could buy balsa water. Mm-hmm. He could do what he wanted to because it was his money. And I think so many of our kids, if they got the idea, if I want something, I could do a job. I could do something small. I mean, you might start by walking dogs or mm-hmm. maybe a couple extra chores around the house. So that the money that you earn is yours to spend, mm-hmm. yours to choose what to do with. I, I think I think a lot of a lot of that that tradition or that idea we've we've lost a lot of that because you mm-hmm. don't see uh, for for whatever reason you don't see a lot of kids working what used to be those traditional after school jobs, mm-hmm. and uh, in, in fact. If, you know, there there are a lot of kids that are still, you know, just involved in structured activity, and they don't have a chance to get out and do things on their own. Do you think that that's one of the things that made Neil so successful? Is that he had a chance to explore and get out and try things, and was allowed to fail? I, I imagine. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I absolutely. I, I, he was kind of. In some ways, and and if you remember back in the day, um, we were out playing kick the can or whatever till somebody would somebody's mom would would open the door and holler time to come in, mm-hmm. and it'd be dark by then. And with my own kids, who my oldest is thirty two, um, I was always driving them places. Mm-hmm. So in in one generation, it it changed that much. Mm-hmm. That has changed. Do you think that it's still possible for there to be a, a Neil Armstrong in the future? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I was at the museum and I was doing a book signing and I was talking to a freshman from another high school, a local high school. And um, he was working towards, he was volunteering at the museum and he was working towards being a pilot. Sounds a little like Neil. Mm -hmm. And he was talking about how how dangerous test pilots doing that. And that's kind of his his dream of choice. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, you know, if you can get into the Air Force Academy, there you go. Your education is free and you'll be flying those planes. So I think there are those kids. There are always those kids. Let's keep our finger crossed for that young person. Hope he makes his dream come true. Oh. What kind he's, of, he's working on it. He's already volunteering in a museum yeah. in the summer. So yeah. that says a lot about him. Good for him. What kind of reaction has have have you received from folks who've read the book? Um, well, it's been interesting. Before it was out, um, my daughter married the son of a NASA scientist. Okay. So I thought, why not ask him, see if he'll write something on the back of the book for the blurb. Mm-hmm. And for a NASA scientist to say this, this is the heart moment for me, this isn't 
um, just a book for a young person. It's a book for young people. Ah. And yeah, I, and I taught second grade. I, I'm not into aviation. And I mean, sometimes when he talks, I just kind of blink because it's, it's over my head. And in fact, he sent me a video. I think I posted it on my um, blog at rendabeach.com. But he had um, something that he had found with the moon landing. And it must have been Neil about 2011. And he's talking through how they landed on the moon. And they have the original pictures from NASA as the limb was going down. And then you have Google Earth or Google whatever it was in 2011. Mm-hmm. And Neil's talking about it and, and quite scientifically. But I got the gist of it. I mean, to know that they were seconds away from being out of fuel and crashing and and would you be able to get back up again? There's so many things that could have been gone wrong. Mm-hmm. So many things. Yeah, yeah. But I had my middle school English teacher read it too as as part of the prep for getting ready to publish. And I had worked on the book for from J- or, I'm sorry, June of last year and this is February. I'm like a couple months away from publishing. I've had like 14 writers, published writers who've looked at this and helped me critique it. And my middle school English teacher read it through and she said, Oh, Renda, I found four mistakes that I think you should look at. And I'm going, Oh my gosh, my, my middle school English teacher is still grading me. But, um, she nailed three of them. They were just simple things that everybody else had overlooked. Mm hmm. But she has the brain of a teacher to, to look for specific things. Yeah. The last thing, it would have taken half a page to explain it. So, so I didn't. But, um, most people that I've, I've talked to have really liked the book. That's- so that means a lot. I saw, um, the brother of, of one of the kids that I, I taught second grade. Mm-hmm. I saw his brother. He was laying on two of those athletic balls that they exercise on uh-huh. or they sit on. And he was laying between the two of them reading my book <laughs> and totally engrossed in reading. So, you know, when you can get a boy to want to read, mm-hmm. that's a good thing. Yeah. Well, that really is a great thing. And, boy, there's so much that you're talking about. You know, you mentioned uh, Google Earth. And, you know, the, we talked earlier about the difference in, in, in technology. I, I mean, th- these days people would have a hard time going from, from one part of Boston to another part of Boston without their, their navigator, without their GPS in the car. Mm-hmm. And meanwhile, we were able to send three men in, in a little tin can up to the moon without any kind of global positioning satellite, without really anything, with no maps and going where, as they say in Star Trek, where no man has gone before. Right. And if you watch the the video section I had on my page, um, it talks about seeing things that they, like there were boulders, and he's thinking, I can't land here, and... And I guess Neil was navigating and Buzz was, was, or Neil was, was piloting and Buzz was, um, doing the navigation so they didn't hit anything. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Incredible. So it, it must have been something and, and no navigation. Yeah. Incredible. Incredible. Well, I, I think that families would have an incredible time sitting down and, and just reading Neil Armstrong's Wind Tunnel Dream. I think this might even be a really fantastic book for grandparents to read with their with their grandkids because grandparents likely lived that and were alive and aware of what was going on at that time. And it would be a great way to kind of uh, talk about growing up and talk about that time with our kids and make it really come alive. In fact, I think it would be great for the grandparents to read it with, with their kids and with their grandkids. Just get like an inter- intergenerational read aloud session going on. Um, Absolutely. You, you, I've had a lot of grandparents buy the book. Uh huh. Yeah. I've been out, which is neat. And the other thing, when I run into kids, um, one of the links at the back of the book, um, I made my husband made a wind tunnel for me for Valentine's Day. Isn't that the greatest? It's beautiful. <laughs> yes, and, he, and um, I could do it now, but he helped me to see how to put it together. 
And I found the site on instructables.com. I'll give them a shout out. Uh-huh. But I have showed so many kids this website and, and they, it's, it's kind of like a science fair site. Oh, and great. you can go in, you can make, there was a taco tunnel for cats the other day they had on. They had stuff that you could make with a 3D printer. Mm. They had face paint. I mean, if if you want to make your own stuff, if you have science fair coming up, this is a great place to go. I've been so impressed with it. Wow, that's great. I've been impressed by rindabeach.com. Oh. That's that's the site where folks can go to learn more about you. Are there other places online where folks can connect with you? Um, I have, and I think you, I sent you the information. I have a Twitter account. I'm on Instagram. I'm on Facebook. But the biggest place that I that I do my writing and I've written everything from hurricanes to uh, little house on the prairie. You know, I've done a little bit of everything because it's a second grade teacher in me. Uh-huh. And that's on, that's on Renda beach.com on my blog. Awesome. And then whatever I'm writing that week, I try to look for a book to match it. And I put that in my reads. Wow. Perfect. Well, we want everybody to check out Neil Armstrong's Wind Tunnel Dream by Renda Beach. We've been speaking to the author tonight. Renda, thank you so much for being on the show. Oh, thank you for letting me share about Neil and and my book in Wapakoneta. Please be sure to join us for the next edition of the Reading With Your Kids podcast. Our guest will be the guys from Five Meets Comics, Oscar Garza, Rolando Esquivel. They'll be telling us about their wonderful comic, Lemon Pepper Hugs. Hey, if you are the author of a children's book, I bet you were surprised when you discovered that you, once you wrote the book, you became the, um, the person in charge of marketing the book. Yeah, especially if you are an independent author. Well, we, we understand that, and we have some great ways to help you promote your book, to help your book stand out from the crowd of books that are published every single week. It's called the Reading With Your Kids Certified Great Read Program. We have created a panel of evaluators there, parents, teachers, and kids. If they believe that your book is worthy of four or five out of five stars, it becomes a certified great read. And with that recognition comes a whole lot of tools that can help your book really stand out and let parents and teachers and librarians know that your book is worthy of their consideration. Find out more today by going to our website, readingwithyourkids.com. We want to thank the folks who made today's show a great listen. Rinda Beach. Rinda Beach, wonderful guest from Wampakoneta, Ohio. Be sure to check out Neil Armstrong's Wind Tunnel Dream. We also want to thank our sponsors, Elaine Kylie Kearns. Check out her book, No One Knows Source. Dr. Dawn Menge and her wonderful Queen Vernita Visitor Series, uh, introducing your kids to all sorts of great wonders of the world and also introducing your kids to some wonderful friends. And, of course, we want to thank our friends at Familius Publishing. Check them out, Familius.com and at Familius Talk on Instagram. I want to thank my amazing producer, Fatima Khan. Thank you, Fatima, for all that you do. Check out Fatima's blog at readingwithyourkids.com. I want to thank my beautiful wife for all the support that she gives me, and I want to thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. And as always, thank you so much for taking the time to make the world a better place by reading with your kids. I'll be looking for you in the next edition of the Reading with Your Kids podcast.